Hi, good afternoon and welcome to this IOSH Logistics and Retail webinar. I'm Andrew Mawson, the chair of the group, and I'd like to welcome today Peter Whitten from Adelia Clark. Um, just a couple of very quick housekeeping notes before we get cracking. In your original invites to the meeting, you probably noticed that it wasn't Peter that was speaking. However, Peter's kindly agreed to join us, so welcome, Peter. You'll uh, get to hear from Peter very shortly. I'll not keep you too long. Um, the reason we decided as Adelia Clark to, as, to invite Adelia Clark to present today was more around the prevention side of drugs and alcohol, of peer support, and to look at the pressures and challenges that our people face working in logistics and retail. So Peter's put, uh, put together a very comprehensive presentation and there'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions at the end. Um, the webinar is being recorded. We will also make sure that if any questions are not answered during the webinar that they are given to Peter to answer afterwards and they'll be available on the Irish website. The Q&A at the end will last as long as we need so we will try and fit as many questions as we can in because we do usually get a lot. So. Uh, without further ado, I'll ask Peter to unmute himself and share his screen uh, and let him get cracking. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, let's, let's try the first thing and see if I can get this screen share to work. Take a drum roll, please. There we go. Andrew, give me a thumbs up, mate, if that's working for you, and then I'll see what's working for everyone else. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Andrew, thank you for that, for that welcome. As Andrew said, unfortunately, uh, it's the other good looking bull chap from Adelia Clark, whose last name starts with W, who you've got today. Uh, David has currently just landed in New Zealand, so we thought it would be harsh to get him up at midnight uh, to do some talking to you. Uh, and and a, a massive thank you to IOSH for hosting us today. It's a real pleasure to be here and a fantastic opportunity to speak to you a bit about our view of impairment and how addressing that appropriately can be used to help retain uh, your employees through support. This is not meant as a sales pitch. I'm going to talk about what we do and how we do it. And there's no there's no sales pressure. And I'm just trying to tell you what we do. Um, aim is to last about 30 minutes. I realize my clocks have been hit now, so I'll, I'll be tapping on my phone to how I'm doing. Um, but uh, yeah, about last about 30 minutes, which will give you plenty of time for all your fantastic questions that I really look forward to ask, answering. So as I say, we are Adelia Clark, um, and the title of this little chat today we've gone for is Retention Through Support, Keeping a Healthy and Happy Workforce. Okay, well, here we go. So first, we need to establish what we're talking about when we say impairment, because for us, impairment is absolutely key to everything that we do. Our aim is to reduce impairment down and support it when we can't. So what do we mean by impairment? Well, it's a deterioration of an individual's judgment and a decrease in that person's mental or physical ability. The absolute key thing I'd like you to take from that is we're talking about mental or physical those of you who are mental health first aiders or involved in the mental health or well-being place will, will, will know that there is a huge increase recently in the understanding that the connection between people, someone's mental health and their physical health is, is so huge. I mean, there's, I, there's an interesting book, I think it's called The Gut or something that my wife is trying to get me to read at the moment, that goes into huge detail about how our gut bacteria and how settled our stomachs are and, and how good our digestive tract has a real impact on where our mental health is. So the more we understand about mental health, the less stigma there is to talk about how we're feeling. And I hate the phrase, but understand it's okay not to be okay. I, one of my life saves to find a better way of saying that. But yeah, to, to understand it's okay not to be okay. And understand that we can talk about when we've had hard times. And I'll be talking about myself today a few times. Um, the more we can understand that and understand the connection between someone's mental and their physical health, the greater chance we have to be able to support people and, and intervene early. Because that early intervention is king. And we'll talk a lot more about that today and how we want to shift that support to as early in the process as possible. So what is our aim of the delay clock? It wouldn't be a talk without a little paragraph of writing. I promise you I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'll pause briefly while you read uh, that through, but I would direct you mainly towards that last sentence. And what we're focusing on there is our aim is to show, as Andrew said, that wherever possible, we want the support for drugs and alcohol to be compassionate, to be supportive, and to minimize the, the punitive actions that, that are taken. Now, 
we recognize i work in the safety critical industry outside of outside of uh, my work with Adelia clark and i am acutely aware that if someone is wearing handcuffs because they've just broken the law it is very hard at that stage to be non-punitive it's very hard to be non-punitive when someone's wearing handcuffs but what we can try and do is support them before it gets to that and in the event that they're not quite at the handcuff being arrested stage we can still try and be non-punitive where we can we also have to acknowledge that we live in an economically reality world. There is an economic reality in the world we live in, and sometimes it might not be appropriate to retain that staff and, and try and bring that staff back into the workplace. But our aim is that whenever possible, we do that. Up the top there, we've got a couple of our key partners. Uh, left to right, we've got Draeger. So if any of you work in uh, industries that have confined spacing or use breathing apparatus or anything like that, uh, you will have probably heard of Draeger. They're a huge German company, and they also provide drug and alcohol testing equipment to most of the world's police forces. Uh, they've got some clever stats somewhere, but at least most of them. The reason they do that is uniformly and without question, their kit comes out rated the, the highest. Whenever there's a, a study, and, and um, if you're curious, we can direct you after this to studies done by the, is it the NTSB in the States or their, their highway safety organization who looked at the quality of all the kit that's around, look at their, how often they have positives that aren't real, what we call a false positive, uh, how often they detect when there is actually something there. And without doubt, without question, and without exception, Draeger comes at the top. So we only use Draeger kit for impairment testing. It's the best, so why would we use anything else? Star Insurance Company is the next one on that list. We have a really good close working relationship with Star Insurance. The reason we're working with insurance, insurance, excuse me, is, is one thing, one thing only, and that is risk bursaries. Your organization will, hopefully, should have insurance of some kind. And within that, it is very likely, depending on what industry you're in, that there will be a risk bursary. Now, the risk bursary is designed to be spent on safety, new safety things, things that can last beyond the initial spend and things that will improve the safety organization. And they can be quite substantial. So we work with STAR through a star, group, star called SCS, uh, STAR Consulting Services, and we provide services. The way that works is that uh, we'll talk to a client and establish a need. They will, then, uh, they will then say they want that. We then talk to STAR and get that approved and the client never even sees an invoice. It all goes through Star and the broker. Um, so whether you're with Star or someone else, it's worth having a look because there's usually pots of cash. They don't advertise it massively. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's worth having a look at whoever your insurance provider is and ask them whether there is a risk bursary within your, uh, your coverage. Finally, Medair, um, if any of you are here from the aviation world, you'll know Medair from the global uh, medical support they offer. Uh, they also work in uh, maritime and, and uh, like big super yacht type things. Uh, they're part of International SOS, who are a far larger US company. Uh, we work with Medair closely because they have a fantastic global network of medical and mental health professionals, and we're working to work out how we can best tap into that uh, so that we can provide support around the world in whatever language um, support might be needed in. So I've talked a bit about, you know, what we are, who we are, and now we get into the how. How do we do what we say we do? And uh, there's four things here, as you can see, well-being, services, effective training, impairment risk, and post-final support. And I'm going to start with well-being services, because that's the front end for us. That's where we hope to deal with everything. If we can get in there first, that, that is the best for everyone. My aim as Director of Wellbeing Services is to put my fantastic colleague Sophie out of business in the impairment risk side because I have managed to capture everyone, support everyone, and ensure that no one has any maladaptive coping strategies and we protect them all at the front end. Clearly, that's not reality of how life actually works. And as a result, we have the impairment risk service side led, as I said, by Sophie. Um, this is where we get the psychoactive substance testing element of it. Um, and this is where we'll talk more in detail in a minute about the actual how, but it's where we do the impairment risk services. What I will say at this stage is, as far as we're concerned, everything flows from your policy. When people, we, when organizations we work with try and work outside their policy, 
everyone kind of comes to grief because then you have tribunal issues and union issues, etc. So everything starts with a good, solid policy, which is why we will always offer the, the free policy review and all that kind of stuff, because there's no better way to do it than to start at the policy. Once you have a fantastic policy, everything flows from there. Sophie, by no coincidence, is a former barrister, and it's important to have everything covered off in that. Um, it might feel like a bit of effort at the start, but it ensures that further down the line, you can actually support people. A good example of this is we had a, a partner organization who didn't have in their policy they could do hair testing, and I'll talk why that's important later, but they didn't have it in their policy. And as a result, when it came time, everyone agreed we wanted to do a hair, hair test, the individual said no. And the company had no pushback on that. No, well, if you don't do it, you lose your job because it's not in their policy. So getting that policy right is so important. Next up, we have post finding services. And again, as I'll, I'll mention it again a bit later on, but the key here is when someone falls through the well-being service and we're unable to support that person for whatever reason, or they don't come to us and they start adopting these maladaptive coping strategies and they end up abusing psychoactive substances, if we when, when we find that person, when the safety net catches that person, excuse me, be it through impairment or be it through a lifestyle test, they will fall into the post finding services section of the um of the company. And again, I'll discuss that more in a minute. Pardon me. <laughs> um, finally, we have at the bottom there underpinning absolutely everything we do effective training. I am so, so passionate about this. I come from a training background, as you expect the training team to be, most of the wellbeing services team have a training background. And that's because we have all learned over time the very, very simple adage that if people don't know about something, they can't use it. It sounds so it's the same. You'd be shocked how many companies spend lots of money on things. I'm thinking mental health first aid here, if there's any. I just say, like, oh, I love MHFA. We use MHFA in a lot of our training. We do the half day mental health aware course as part of what we do. Claire Bahara, who runs the peer support, our main peer support program for us, she's a mental health first aid instructor. I think it's a fantastic bit of training. But so often, so, so often, companies pay to do that and they don't train their staff on it. They don't explain that it's there. They don't get the word out. And as well, most mental health first aiders I run into have never been used, which is so frustrating because they, they put themselves forward, they're, they're keen to be involved, and then they're not utilized. So for us, effective training underpins everything we do. Um, be that through e-learning, be that through online like we're doing here or even in person. The quality of that training is absolutely vital. And I, I genuinely believe the, the, the quality of training we put out there is the reason why we have such high level of, of engagement with a lot of what we do. That's what we do. Where do we do it? We do it across industry. Uh, we started in aviation. Um, and with aviation, we, short, we support corporate clients like Tag Aviation and NetJets. We support cargo clients like West Atlantic, scheduled airlines like Flybe and Norwegian. Um, skipping off here, I'm sure I'm missing someone out. Hopefully no one's here who I'm missing out. Oil and gas, ExxonMobil, Maritime, Port of Sunderland, EV cargo in the freight industry. So we support across industries, anywhere the safety critical workers we feel can use what we do. So we're now going to sort of break down each of those I spoke about a minute ago into a bit more detail. And we'll start with peer support, because for us, that is the front end of what we are trying to do. But what is peer support? Well, I have absolutely no doubt that everyone on this call has at some point in their life engaged in peer support, because basically it's talking to a peer. What is a peer? Well, we define that as someone with a shared background, shared lived experience and shared training, which in essence is anyone you work with or probably a lot of your friends and colleagues. So you would have undoubtedly spoken to a friend or colleague about stuff. You are therefore getting peer support. Congratulations, that's fantastic. So peer support exists in all of our workplaces, exists all the time. It has definitely gotten harder in the new modern remote world. But even then, you still see people hopefully, you know, outside of your house and, and, and you are engaging in peer support. So what do we do that takes it from that informal chatting to a, a friend, a mate, whoever, a colleague, and creates that, that structure around it? We do a number of things. First off, as you'd be unsurprised to hear what I just said with training, we do training and we do high, high quality training. And the first people we train are what we call key stakeholders. Now, key stakeholders are the interface between the workforce, the front line of the workforce and the management layer. They might be managers themselves. They might be HR, people, services, whoever it is. It depends on the size of the organization. But those people are absolutely vital to the success of a peer support program. The reason being, at the start of any program's life, you have to prime the pump. It's a phrase of Claire Harold, program leader, was here right now. She'd be laughing at me because I use it all the time. But it's so true. 
we can do all the training in the world, we do all the advertising, etc. excuse me, uh, <laughs> computer getting all excited, but without those managers, or those, those, those interface between the workforce and the management or the managers themselves, having the knowledge and being able to tell the workforce what's going on and recommend a call, little, super little things, like instead of saying, um, do you want to call peer support? That sounds awful. Why don't you call peer support? Swapping that round to saying, would you accept a call from peer support? I'll do it for you. Little tweaks like that as it is the, the thing we provide would allow us to prime the pump of an effective peer support program. Once we've trained the, uh, the, the key stakeholders, the, the next sort of key people in any peer support program, unsurprisingly, are the peer support volunteers, PSVs as we call them. And the peer support volunteers are volunteers, as the name suggests. We have always been very um, firm in the fact that we never remunerate and we encourage companies not to remunerate people to do the PSV role. We think that can be quite negative. You get the wrong people coming forward. We have never had a shortage of people volunteering to be PSVs. Quite the opposite. We're always having to bat people away um, when companies put people forward. So remuneration has never entered it. So they are volunteers, and we think that's the best way to do it. And we do training with them. And one of the most important things we do is we teach them to listen. But Peter, I hear you cry. I'm listening to you now, and I've not even had any training on it. Well, are you, though? I don't know how many times I've had, and I'm sure we've all had that time when you're talking to a peer, a colleague, a friend, a partner, perhaps, say nothing, a partner, perhaps, and you, you're you talking, but actually they're not listening. Well, they're not listening to hear. They're listening to reply. They're not doing what we would call active listening. They're just listening, as I say, to, to figure out what they're going to say next to keep that conversation going, which is fine in a normal chat, but not useful when you're trying to open up to someone about it. So a big part of the training is we teach them how to listen. We also do a lot of work on, on common problems and solutions and signposting is a big part of their role is signposting onto other, other um, things that are available. And uh, because no course these days would be complete without it, we do quite a lot of stuff on GDPR because they are handling people's data. So the PSV training is really important. However, three days of training with us followed by recurrent training and et cetera during the year, will not make these people professionals. They are enthusiastic volunteer amateurs. And they know that. And that's part of their, their sort of job description they sign up to. And I am not a psychologist. And, and neither are they. So we have to have that backup. And we have an amazing mental health professional team. And we have people ranging from clinical psychologists who have worked for you know, 20, 30 years in the field and are absolute experts and chairs of various roles of science, et cetera, down to well-being or menopause specialists or, or anything else you can think of. And we have a fantastic network of these individuals who both support us with the clinical oversight and compliance in those industries where there's a compliance requirement, but also allow us someone to signpost PSVs to you. Because we take, we take the protection of the peer support volunteers very seriously. It is a huge vote of trust for a company to say, take this person, we entrust them to you to then hear other people's problems, probably outside their organization, because we're all about networking organizations together to help with that anonymity of support requests. So it's a huge vote of trust, and that opens that individual up to secondary, vicarious, trauma, compassion, fatigue, all these things that we really want to avoid. So we spend a huge amount of time and energy and money um, making sure our PSVs are supported by these mental health professionals. The, the final thing is, is kind of what I alluded to a second ago, which is creating the network, which allows people to reach outside of organizations. When we started peer support, uh, we actually started it in the aviation sector. We were only really aiming at small and medium sized operations, five, 600 people. Um, and you can't really get anonymity there, especially in aviation, where if you are, say, a female, it's very hard to find someone who doesn't know your voice because it's all very small groups. And we've provided them for the last three or four years, and, and more and more we are finding the big operators, the the you know the large uh, all, all over the world, coming to us and talking about getting engaged with the with the col collaborative approach to this, because they can see the benefit of reaching out. Even if you've got a huge 15, 20,000 person organization, the ability to reach outside of that, even if it's not technically needed for anonymity because it's such an organization, the mental side of being able to jump outside of your organization feels like you are getting more anonymity. So we really see that this is the way of the future, networking organizations that are similar together and allowing people to reach outside. We've only got, well, I give myself half an hour, an hour total here, so I won't go into the vast amount we do around red flag behavior and support and the way we protect everyone in that networked approach, um, but it is all there in the background. So that's peer support. 
if people fall through the gaps, so if people don't come to us for support, we do end up in the testing element. Now, I should mention briefly, I've used the phrase a few times, maladaptive coping strategies. It's worth quick talking about what I mean there. So when we go through stuff, and we, I'm sure everyone on this call, unfortunately, has been through life events, major life events um, in, in their time. When we go through stuff like that, we will cope with it. And we'll cope with it in broadly two different ways, either an adaptive coping strategy, like, for example, uh, seeking help, speaking to a peer support volunteer, speaking to a peer, speaking to family, maybe getting therapy, maybe addressing one's personal well-being by trying to go out for a walk at lunch or changing diet, whatever it is to increase our own personal well-being. So that is sort of classic, there are many more, but classic adaptive um, coping mechanisms. On the flip side, we have maladaptive coping strategies, but it's worth saying they are still coping strategies. They will still help that person, just not for very long. And maladaptive coping strategies are your, your standard... Um, sorry, I've got to sneeze and say I'm thinking where it's going to come. I apologise. <laughs> maladaptive coping strategies are things like abusing psychoactive substances, misusing psychoactive substances, because remember, alcohol is a psychoactive substance, so we can all use that without it becoming a misuse. So misusing psychoactive substances, um, gambling, having an affair, all these, you're driving too fast on the road. These are all maladaptive coping strategies. And we specifically want to talk here about uh, the, the abuse of psychoactive substances. You see the picture on the up on my screen, you see the picture on your screen there. We've got the various different ways of testing. Um, the big red line there is the consumption. That is the point of consumption of the psychoactive substance. And then on the bottom, we have a, a graph of scale showing minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, etc. Now, at Adelie Clark, a point of test, so coming out to you to do a test, so a four cause or a round test, um, uh, that's tested for impairment, we will only use oral fluid. Blood can be a bit better, but you've got to have a, someone who's qualified to take the blood and a whole bunch of extra things, and you're then sending blood through the post. So there's a whole bunch of extra costs associated with it. And oral flu is pretty much as good. For lifestyle, blood is better, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but for, for impairment, oral fluid is pretty jolly good at what it does with the Draga kit that we use. And then you can see urine. It's always a little bit weird talking so passionately about urine, but urine is, if you'll forgive me, useless at testing for impairment because blood and oral fluid are testing for um, active compounds in your bloodstream. What is currently affecting your brain? What is causing that impairment that we are trying to test for? Urine is testing for metabolites. So it's testing for what has been through my system come out the other side. By definition, that is not impairing me anymore because it's metabolized. So if your organization is using urine to test for impairment, I hate to say it, you're not testing for impairment. You're testing for kind of middle ground lifestyle. And the reason we don't use urine for lifestyle is it doesn't have a far enough reach. So with hair and fingernails, if we're looking back in the past of what someone has done, we can go months back. It's based on the length of hair, so you might struggle with me, but they'd force me to grow my fingernails out. And then you can get months and months back and look at a full picture. But again, hair and fingernail, we would never use for an impairment test because when you're testing for metabolites, you're seeing what has been through the system. And in fact, we quite like hair and fingernails for that reason, because it doesn't check the last couple of weeks. So it's when someone says, well, I had a really big weekend, you know, lads holiday and Ibiza or whatever it was last weekend, it doesn't impact the lifestyle test. We are looking at a, a pattern of behavior. It's worth very quickly saying what sort of pattern, because people tend to be worried by lifestyle testing. They tend to think, well, I, um, it's Christmas, isn't it? It's a holiday period. People are having lots of drinks going out with my friends on Thursday. It'll be all good fun. Oh no, what if I get lifestyle tested? So all the literature is there, but you know, I, we also wanted to try it for real. So we got some friends of the business, um, outside colleagues, and, and we sort of tested their hair samples. And in fact, I had a very good friend of mine who was, um, who was in the military and was deployed somewhere where there was a lot of quite cheap alcohol. Uh, anyone who's been in the forces, I'll take your guesses. And they were concerned about their intake. They were drinking a lot, um, a lot, a lot, a lot. And they asked us for a hair sample. So we did one for them. And they didn't even register. Didn't even register. And again, with our with our, our, our friends of the business who, who we tested, they were drinking a lot. These were not light, these are heavy social drinkers. And they were scoring maybe a seven or a 10. And to give you context on that, anything below a 25 or 30, we're not that concerned. Over 25, we start getting worried. That's into a, a, an amber range for us. 
So we are not worried. Hair samples are not getting the person who likes to have a social drink with his mates. What they're getting is that individual who has those social drinks with their friends and then goes home and drinks a bottle of wine and maybe a bottle of vodka. That is the person, the person who has a really, really negative relationship with the uh, the alcohol. So yeah, blood and oral fluid for impairment, for impairment, they are the best things. Hair and finger, because they are testing what's active and uh, hair and fingernails for what comes after. Urine sits in the middle somewhere, it doesn't really do impairment, doesn't really do lifestyle, is dirty, is horrible. You have to close down a toilet for 24 hours. I would say I did the Air Force for a bit. I have watched, been watched very closely by friends as I've had a wee and a pop, and I've had to watch my friends very, very closely, intimately almost, whilst they had a pee. It's degrading, it's horrible, we don't like urine. On the left-hand side, we are independent of labs. We sit outside of them, we use who we feel is most appropriate for the most appropriate test, and that gives us a lot of flexibility and, uh, and added resilience. We only use Home Office approved kit for impairment. Why does that matter? Well, if you have to go to a tribunal of some kind, I hate to say it, but that £2.99 Amazon drug swipe checky thing will not hold up and you will end up in a whole lot of trouble. So we only use home of brew stuff. We only use stuff with proper chain of custody. So a lot of the training we do with our new testers and we've got a fantastic app that we're launching in the new year. So it's all paperless now. That is all, all focused on chain of custody, all tracked so that should we have to go to tribunal of some kind, it is all there. As I said, we want to focus on impairment, not lifestyle, but there is a place for lifestyle. I'll very briefly share my personal view on lifestyle testing hair and fingernails. When I, before I joined Delia Clark, I heard about lifestyle testing and I thought, no, I thought that is an invasion of my privacy. That is unnecessary. That is unacceptable. I don't want to hear it. And then I learned two things. I, I learned about how much you've actually got to drink to flag it up. And, and with the best will in the world, I'm still not going to flag that up. But I also came to realize the joy, the fantastic thing about hair and fingernail testing is you can be non-punitive with it because no one's broken the law. It doesn't check for the last week and a half, two weeks. So you're never going to get someone being impaired on a hair and fingernail task. But what it does let you do is find the person who is clearly struggling and support that person through the post-finding service of support. So I've really come around. I'm a massive proponent that it, provided it is done in a trusted environment in with the right culture and it's not being able to catch people out and get rid of them i think there's a huge place for hair and fingernails um we've got some of the unions we work with at the bottom uh unions understandably have the what they view as the best interest of, of their members at heart a lot of their view in, in general on drug and alcohol comes from a lack of knowledge and it's completely understandable because they've got to cover the huge sway of employer employee relationships and drug and alcohol is one small part so one of the things we often offer and we did it recently with balpa who are the pilot the british airways um sorry the british airlines pilots association is to offer a free webinar we do a bit of chatting and then we take questions and we take a lot of questions because there's so many rumors floating around and people thinking certain things but we sit there and we just take the questions and we take the feedback and in every time we've done that everyone goes away happy because they've been able to ask that question they've been able to challenge us we love an assertive challenge bring it on we've got the answers we believe what we do and we use the right kit so we love engaging with the unions to try and explain to them why it is we recommend what we recommend and to take their questions at Adelia Clark we don't really care why you're impaired if that's if that's an okay thing to say i don't really care are you fit to do your job are you a a a you know a, a alert member of the workforce who can do whatever role we need you to do on that day bluntly as a as a manager i don't really care if you're impaired because you're drunk that's not acceptable you can't do your job i don't care if you're on drugs that's not acceptable you can't do your job I don't care if it's because you are having, I, I don't care is the wrong word. I'm agnostic to the reason for your impairment. If it's a huge fight with your partner or your child, whatever it is, I want to treat you in the same compassionate way, regardless of the reason for your impairment. It doesn't matter to me what has caused it, be it drugs, be it alcohol, be it a relationship thing, be it a child thing, be it a general life event. It doesn't matter to what matters to me, which is, are you fit to do your job on that day? With that in mind, we're partnering with an organization in the States who have got a fantastic tool called Alert Meter. Now, I've got two slides on this. This is about an hour and a half briefing by itself. So I'm going to do super top level. If you want any more information, let us know. Um, but as I say, this is a two slide thing on about an hour and a half chat because this is an amazing bit of kit. 
The background of this, it was created by NASA and the US Highway Safety Agency. It's a psychomotor vigilance test. And the reason NASA spent a whole bunch of money developing it, uh, along with the part of our partners in the States, is that psychomotor vigilance tests existed, but they were all not very good for two reasons. One, they took about 15 minutes to complete, excuse me, 15 minutes to complete. Who's got time for that at the start of a job? And also they were based on a norm, a norm of societal alertness, if you like. And that raises all sorts of problems. The joy of alert meter, the game, it's not test, the game that we play in alert meter is that it's, it, once you create that baseline, which takes about 10 days, it is registering you against your alertness. Are you within the normal range of your alertness or are you outside the normal range? It is an incredibly bit of, a clever bit of kit to the point that if I gave it to Andrew to do it and Andrew was super alert that day, it would still give me an outside normal range because it knows how many milliseconds it normally takes me to spot a, a shape. So it, it learns hugely about you. And that's all it is. It's picking which shape is different or the same and memorizing shape for short periods of time. How do we actually use it? Well, we encourage organizations to use it at the start of work. Uh, you do this, it's about 90 seconds. Again, that's the real joy of it. It's not 15 minutes, it's 90, 90 seconds. And it will give you a score. And in the green, we have the normal range, and in the red, we have the outside normal range. Provided you score in the normal range, that's fine, off you go. That is not to say that person might not have some stuff going on in their life, but by a measure of alert meter, they are alert. Scoring outside normal range gives you a little flag up, says uh, you scored outside the normal range, give yourself a minute, collect your thoughts, try again. Again, it's only 90 seconds, you're not losing very much time at all. If they have a second ONR, all that triggers is a conversation. It's not go home, you're done, I don't want to talk to you anymore. It just triggers a conversation. Conversation with, uh, be it a manager, be it what we we're terming a trusted broker, someone you can go to and talk about it. And it allows that conversation that clearly hasn't happened already because the person hasn't come in and said, I'm going through this life event. That conversation that hasn't happened allows them to have it. And the example when uh, Predictive Safety, who the company that, that, that used alert meter, the example they give is a, an individual who was operating a 90 ton tray, a crane, excuse me, at a steelworks. And this individual um, had come into work, took alert meter, ONR'd twice and went to talk to his manager. And it turned out, um, this is in the States, where obviously their healthcare rules, He's his son was in hospital. He hadn't slept for the last 24, 36 hours. He was in a really bad way. And he had come to work because he couldn't afford to miss a day of work because of the hospital bills. And he was about to operate a huge 90 ton crane over a crowded factory when his mind could not have been further from focusing on this. And you can see here, there's actually his chart shared with permission. He does two ONRs there and then a couple of days off and he came back and he scored well in his normal range. So it's a hugely powerful tool. It's very quick to do. It's super cost efficient and it captures those people. What you then use to trigger that with, maybe if the person comes in, maybe you then smell booze on their breath and that's an opportunity to trigger a, a full cause drug test. Maybe it's someone coming in and the signposting is, look, go speak to PS4, have a conversation with them. We'll chat through it all and then we'll try another one. Maybe just take a day off because you're not safe to be here right now. We are very, very excited about what Alert Media can do in the, in the safety industry because as I say, from its perspective, it doesn't mind why you're not impaired. All it cares about is, is that person fit to do the job on that day? Finally, then, uh, I'm going to speak very briefly about post finding services. So this is what we do to remind you when someone has flagged up at the impairment or the, uh, for a high lifestyle impairment, we want to support this person. And ideally, we want to retain this person in the workforce. Not always. And I, I said there are economic realities and there's sometimes unavoidable punitive measures. But where possible, we do. Why do we want to? Well, firstly, I feel like morally it's the right thing to do, if possible, if the economic situation allows, because there's a good chance that the work we're asking that person to do may have contributed to the place they are. Secondly, if we can support someone who is in a really, really dark place, I'm going to talk about a case study in a second. If we can show we can support this individual, then people will come to us when they are in a better place and a better way because they have known when if I get to that level, I'll be supported. So I know at this level where I'm better, I can be supported now. That requires a huge amount of trust for the individual who, who has been supported to share their story. But if we can get to that point, it's hugely powerful because then people get supported as early as possible. And finally, 
quite often, certainly in some of the industries we work in with specialist workers, it can be a heck of a lot cheaper to retain someone through our uh, assessment and the support and action process than it is to go out to the open market and hire someone new. So how does that actually work? Well, briefly, we have the finding. We will be telling you about the findings. So once we've told the, the organization about the finding, we need to support that person. And the first thing we need to do is we need to get blood tests. I mentioned before that the impairment style um, for, for blood is kind of much of a muchness. It, it is, but blood is still better. And you can also do a single blood test and get detail that you would never get through a blood test. For example, liver function test, which can be a really powerful thing to hold up to someone who we have yet to have a PFS, a post fire support individual who has admitted they have a problem. Every single person has said, no, I'm fine. A liver function test can be really powerful. So we want to get those bloods done within two or three days of the finding, if at all possible. It's not always be possible, but that is our, going to be our target. Because once you wait two weeks, a bit longer, you start to lose the full picture of what was going on in that person's life when they had it. If, for example, you, you, you wait a month, and we're talking about alcohol, say, and that person has abstained for that month, you will get vastly different readings than you would if you if you test them within a week. So our aim is always to get the initial test done early. Once we've got the results of that test, which should be a few days after, we go to the assessment phase. We use a three panel assessment. We use an occupational health doctor. Um, we use a clinical psychologist with drug and alcohol experience. And those two do an initial assessment of the individual. If either of those are seeing dangerous flags, I wouldn't say red flags, but you know amber flags that they're not happy with, they can internally recommend we engage the um, addiction psychiatrists. So if you want to know, psychologists are usually PhD or masters who are experts in psychology. Psychiatrists are doctors who are experts in psychology. So that slightly different medical element of it. So we are addiction psychologists involved and maybe another panel of tests. Once we have the results of that, it goes to what we call the round table, where we sit down with the Oc Health doctor, the psychologist, psychiatrist, and we look at all the results. We come together with a single assessment and we make a recommendation to the company. There is no requirement for our, for our partners to follow this recommendation, but we highly, highly recommend they do. And that action really varies from a bit of alcohol education, a bit of working on vulnerability factors to a full you know, six month support package. It really varies depending on the person. But again, there's no, there's no requirement for the company to use that. It's just we offer that as, a, as an initial, this is what we're suggesting. I promise you a case study. This started with PFS01. And it started because we were going into meetings and we were sitting down with head of HR, senior people, services people, and we were having to tell them that they had an individual who had failed a test for some reason. And that was so hard for that person to hear. And, and it just didn't work for us to give this awful news and then go, cheerio, let's see you later and walk out the door. That didn't feel okay to us. Here's a massive problem. And they would say every time, what do we do now? And her answer would be, don't know. <laughs> See you later. And that, that wasn't okay. That wasn't okay. So we started post filing support and almost immediately having started it, we had a case, PFS01. This individual was consuming approximately 12 pints of beer, equivalent alcohol, a day. A day. As I said, this is not someone who is just having a social drink. This is consistent every single day consuming that volume, that quantity of alcohol, not always in beer and various other methods. He got uh, found during a lifestyle test, during a hair sample test, which is great because the company could be non-punitive. And he was initially taken off the safety critical role, came through our assessment and the recommendation with a six month process, uh, not with sobriety, two drinks a week, um, he was allowed, and a whole bunch of journals and support and education. And what was great about being able to support this individual with a lot of their problems were based on, on situational effects, i.e. money worries, um, marriage ending worries, access to children worries, etc. that could all be addressed over that six month period. And the individual was only actually off their safe critical role for a couple of weeks before they were back flying. Um, and we were able to support that person through through that whole process. Uh, and they popped up the other end of that, that program and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and they actually want to join our program now as a supporter, which is the highest praise I could possibly take. So that is post filing support. We've got to get in there quickly because if we wait too long, the information is not going to be adequate. It's not going to give us that full picture. We come up with the assessment and then we recommend an action. So I have spent enough of my time talking. It's now my chance to listen. Um, and I will just say thank you very much for your time. I really appreciated it. Uh, thank you for letting me share that. And I'll, I'll welcome Andrew back now. 
Thanks very much indeed for that. That was very insightful, Peter. I think there's, there's quite a number of questions. I think I'll just go through them in order. Um, feel free to take as long as you need to answer because some of them are quite in depth. Uh, and as I said earlier, right at the start, any that we can't do now, we'll make sure go on the website. So our first question is, can you please advise the difference between the testing you describe and the relatively new science of testing through fingerprinting? And then the million dollar question, which do you think is best? <laughs> It's a great question, Paul. So we were at a, web, uh, a conference last year in Birmingham, the NEC, um, and uh, there was a chap there showing off the fingerprinting stuff. And it looks fantastic. It's really great. I mean, you don't need an oral swab. You're not taking a, a bodily fluid. It's all fantastic. It raised a number of concerns for us. Um, we know that I think one in 10, you know, five pound bills has traces of cocaine on. How do we trace that? The individual selling it, as you'd expect, because they were selling it, had answers to everything. We wanted to dig a bit deeper um, and we said, can you please provide the scientific backup? And he said, yeah, absolutely. We said, we'd really like to see it because we'd like to know more about this because when I get asked questions about the difference between relatively new science of testing through fingerprints, <laughs> which is better, I have my view because I have seen the science on oral fluid. I have seen the results from the uh, your home office approvals uh, that are extensive. I've seen the science from the US on testing it. Fingerprints have never been on there. They are relatively new. And this individual in there, Perhaps sales said, yes, absolutely. Took all our email address and I will send that to you. We're coming up on a year. Maybe it's maybe it's finding its way through the ethernet and it's going to be with us any day now. But if to be honest, this stuff is too serious to use kit that isn't established and, and supported, home office approved, et cetera, tested at the highest level. If fingerprint testing becomes the greatest thing, fantastic. I'm sure we'll get involved in it in somehow. But at the moment... No one has got the evidence. No one is, is willing to back up their views on it with science and actual empirical evidence. So it's exciting. It's a great idea. I don't, I, I see no evidence to, for it being a, a usable solution at the moment. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> we've had a request, which I'm sure we can do at the end, uh, for, to provide the link for the union course that you mentioned when you were on your, your page regarding the unions. Yeah, I'll just say, Andrew, it's not actually a, a course that we run per se. We just hold free webinars. If you're involved with the union, you want us involved, just, just drop us a line. Andrew, what's the best way for them to get in touch with us? LinkedIn, I guess, well, or do you provide our details? Yeah, via LinkedIn, or they can go direct to the logistics and retail LinkedIn, and we can get that back to you, whichever is easiest right. for anybody to contact us, or obviously yeah, direct Diana, to IOSH. Diana, we'll we're, always sure really happy to, we're always really happy to engage free of charge with unions because that's where the good practice flows from. And we are all about best practice. Um, so, yeah, very happy to, to engage on that. Absolutely. Excellent. And then we've got one that says, I had an employee. I knew he was drinking. HR said, I can't send him home if he refuses to test and I can't administer. What options are there for retail managers providing employees are using, and in this case, are we using machinery? such as slices, so on. Um, what options do our retail colleagues have if there's a refusal? It's a fantastic, uh, great question, Diana. And, and it feeds back to what I was talking about policy. Without your correct policy, there isn't actually anything you can do. There's nothing you can do. You can, in our policy, it would say if you refuse a test, it counts as a, as a failure of that test. But again, that comes from the policy. If your policy doesn't cover it and someone's refusing, your hands are a little bit tied. You could perhaps send them home as a safety concern, the same way if someone was clearly falling asleep because they were so tired, you could send them home for a safety concern. But actually tackling that drinking needs to be policy-based and cover. Everything flows from that policy. Provide you have a policy that says it, then it's really easy because if they refuse to breathalyze, that's a failure, at which point they have just failed a breath test and then they are effectively over the limit whether they've blown or not. So it flows from the policy and it's why we offer the free policy review because before it's even worth talking with a, a new company about what we do we need to understand where we are and what we're what our targets are and what you want to support um but yeah it's, it's a great question diana and it as i say all flows from the policy we've got a lot of interest in the uh alert meter you'll not be surprised to hear <laughs> now <laughs> take as long as you need on this one but a lot of questions about how we might and I'm, it's, it's probably not the right word to use, but sell the alert meter to colleagues in the workplace. How do we tell them it's a good thing and, and what good looks like? A great question, Andrew. 
it's all about the culture of the organization and explaining why we need it there and explaining that should you have an ONR, should the, the, it go outside, that is not uh, an instigation for a punitive measure. Now, if you score an ONR and you walk into your manager's office barely able to stand stinking of booze, I have bad news for you, you're going to get a test. Or if there's some other reason that, you know, you're smelling of some other substance, you're going to probably get a test and we kind of avoid that. But we often like to say no one plans to come to work impaired. That person rocking up drunk has not sat there in the morning going, you know what, today I'm going to be drunk at work. It's no one's plan. So in terms of selling to the workforce, we focus on the other stuff. People don't know always when they're impaired. And this is a really key thing. So about a year ago, I was going through a pretty hard time with some stuff at, at the other work that I do and various bits and bobs of life events and blah. And I had to go for a hearing test. And I thought I was dealing with the stress okay. I thought I was there or thereabouts. Um, and I couldn't hear. I failed my hearing test twice. Not your hearing is not great, Pete. You are deaf. As in, you sh I shouldn't be able to hear the person administering the test. It was that bad. They did it. They thought, the system must be broken. I've always had really good hearing. Do it again. Fail again. I hadn't appreciated how impaired I was. Those who, who know a bit about the, the study of impairment and, and, and capacity buckets and stress buckets of your MHFA again, I was, I was exhibiting classic signs of my capacity, my stress bucket overflowing. I, I had no space left to hear the beeps. I was impaired. I shouldn't have been driving, but I hadn't recognized that. So we want to use alert meter as a supportive method to identify those times when people just think they've got to just, just push on and get through. And then support that person through peer support, through MHFA, through look, take a day. Um, and that will generate concerns about people intentionally failing alert me to try and get a day off. I will save the reason why that's not an issue for the hour and a half briefing with our American colleagues because they're all over that stuff. But suffice to say, the way we sell it, the way we push it into a, a company is all about trust and culture. And we want to support you. It never works by itself. You know, you want to be doing other stuff for the person's well-being and support. Just, oh, by the way, there's alert me to go use that. There has to be a broader thing. Otherwise, you're absolutely right. Whoever's asking those questions, it's it's really hard to sell to the workforce. Bluntly, though, once you've done that selling, it should become part of the natural report process. At which point, like everything else you have to do, wear a hard hat, steel coat, boots, whatever it is, you don't really need to sell it to them because it's a requirement for them to do their job. You've got to be correctly attired with PPE. You've got to do alert meter before each shift. Brilliant. Yeah, makes sense. A um, couple of questions about the peer support volunteers mm -hmm. uh, back in sort of drug and alcohol world and so on. The most obvious question to start with is who supports the volunteers? So what's the what's available out there, whether it's from yourselves or anybody else, you know, the mental health first aiders and so on. The questions aim more about how do you get the peer support volunteers first and what's the support network for them? Uh, another another great question. Um, as I mentioned during the during the chat, the trust placed in us with companies to provide these PSVs is one we take incredibly seriously. And supporting those PSVs through that secondary vicarious trauma is something we take very seriously. So we recently had a, a PSV who was going through a tough time, and we immediately got one of our, our clinical psychologists to have a session with him. Um, we've done that twice in the last couple of months uh, and that is that's covered in whatever you, whatever the, the clients pay to us it's completely outside of that the client never knows about that because we're dealing with a PSV so supporting them is done through through when there is an event we support them or if they if they flag themselves up we also do quarterly um, supervision sessions with them either with program lead who is a who is a psychologist as well um, or a more senior clinical psychiatrist so quarterly we also have monthly get-togethers or bi-monthly get-togethers where we all just get in a room and we chat about what we've seen recently, things that we're struggling with, et cetera. So we create that community of support. So it's a number of ways, but it is always the top of our, our risk ratio, if you like, is we have to support those peer support volunteers. It's absolutely vital. Excellent. And one last one, uh, a question around the hair and nails testing. And that's about how because um, you said obviously that it's, it's a more longer term type of testing and the questions really focused on if we are you know industry is quite used to saying you need to do the urine test or you need to do uh, your blood whatever it might be or your or your, uh, your fluids how 
what's the difference in approach for taking the hair and nails testing? Is it literally, can I cut your nails? Or <laughs> I'm being very flippant, but what's that process for taking the test? It's precisely what you described there, Andrew. So um, joking aside, for an individual like myself, you would struggle to get more than um, a few, uh, a month or so from me, uh, if you were lucky. But we don't have to take hair sample. We can take forearm. Um, we don't never take underarm because of the reabsorption process uh, for alcohol. So that would give a really false reading. But we have, how can I phrase this delicately? We have someone who came in and described themselves as dolphin smooth. That's how they describe themselves to us. Um, the answer is don't chew your nails for two weeks and you get significantly more per millimeter of nail than you do for hair. That's fine, we should come back in two weeks and do it. This individual was into their triathlon and everything. They were, it was, it was not doing it as an avoidance, but you know, some people might. And the answer is not a problem at all. We'll see in two weeks with long fingernails, please. You can't force someone to grow your hair, if only you could. Um, so <laughs> it is, it is fingernails is, is the answer. Excellent. Well, that brings us to the end of the questions, which is great. So thank you for answering those. Uh, and more than that, thank you for giving up your time to speak to us. It's really appreciated. That was excellent. Um, as I've said to everybody, the transcript and the recording will be available on the IOSH website. You'll find Peter on LinkedIn if you need to talk to him. And those links will show up on our LinkedIn pages for logistics and retail afterwards. Thanks again, Peter. That was great. And thank you, everybody, for attending.